Hello, and welcome to today's Environment and Energy Leader webinar titled From Climate to Human Rights, Managing Supply Chain, sponsored by Navex with speakers from Applied Materials and FTI Consulting. My name is Jessica Hunt, and I'm the Director of Live Events for e, &E Leader. Before I hand the presentation over to our speakers today and moderator, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items with attendees. Hopefully I can get through this quick intro without an interruption from one or both of my dogs. First and foremost, thank you for being with us wherever you are in the world today. In case you are unable to join this event live, it will be available on demand by Wednesday evening. If you are having technical issues, please troubleshoot first using the help widget at the bottom of your console. And in case you need additional assistance, please send a message via the Q&A chat widget, which is open on your screen. Attendees do have the ability to chat with each other during the event as well. To utilize the attendee chat feature, you may have to double click on enter your message. And at this point, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Karen Alorando, at VP of ESG Solutions at Navex, and hopefully I didn't butcher your last name too much there. <laughs> You totally did. It's Alonardo, but don't worry about it, Jess. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so uh, good morning and afternoon and evening to everyone here. Um, my name is Karen Alonardo, as uh, Jess mentioned. Um, I am the uh, VP of ESG Solutions here at Navex. Um, so, you know, today we're just going to, you know, we're going to go through um, our webinar, which is focused on, um, you know, anything from climate to human rights, right? How do you manage excuse me, scope three risk, right? Um, so we're, that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna, you know, delve into it a little bit and then we'll take Q&A at the end. Um, but I'd also like you to know, right, we have some, um, you know, for the attendees today, we have, we also will provide you access to ESG specific resources that are really designed to help you follow along with today's material available for download, including our definitive guide to getting started with ESG. Um, I worked with the, uh, our team on that, and it's a pretty good document. If you guys need to just kind of get started, kind of look at the lay of the land, it's a great document to help you kind of frame your ESG uh, discussions internally. So uh, I would highly recommend that. Um, and, um, you know, there's a Navex ESG Disclosures Solution Brief uh, that details the Navex solution for simplifying ESG reporting. Um, not to be not to be on the sales side, but we can assist you on your ESG journey, right? So just to kind of put that out there, um, and just in terms of some of the housekeeping, right? Um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, Jess may have already said this, but uh, bear with me. Um, and you'll receive an archive uh, webinar packet in about a week, right? So if, and and also if you have any technical questions, um, you know, please send us a message, and someone from our team will assist you. Um, and lastly, please feel free to submit any questions in the Q&A section uh, at any time during the webinar. Uh, we'll try to address many of the questions during, um, during the discussion. Um, but uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, introductions. So um, just, I guess I'm moving the uh, slides along. Okay. So let me uh, go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, so uh, Kim Vu um, and Rodolfo. Uh, I've worked with the two of them for many years. Uh, we all have a lot of good expertise in scope three and just across ESG in general. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and what's happening with the slide? It's okay. There we go. Um, so let me let me start with myself, right? So I'm, you know, like I said, I'm Karen. Um, I came over to Navex around, uh, gee, I guess uh, October 2020, roughly. Um, I was the founder and CEO of CSRWare, which was corporate social responsibility software that I had founded back in, uh, gosh, about 2009 or so uh, during the first clean tech wave um, that obviously evolved into, you know, sustainability, ESG uh, management software that is, has been rebranded to Navix ESG. So I'm really happy to be part of the Navix family now, which has expanded upon ESG in terms of risk management, third party risk, and uh, other aspects of ESG that uh, really is compelling. Um, and I've also, um, as, I, as I mentioned, I'm joined uh, by Kim Vu. Uh, Kim, you might wanna just say hello, introduce yourself, and then hand it over to Rodolfo, and we'll kick off our discussion. Sure, thanks, Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Bok Vu. Uh, I've been in sustainability, ESG, um, CSR, I guess, however you want to call it, maybe about the same time as Karen, about 2008, 2009. I've worked specifically in supply chain uh, 10 of those years. 
looking forward to speaking Great. to you all today. Excellent. Rodolfo? Rodolfo, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There you are. Yes. Perfect. Hi. So hi, everybody. Uh, first, uh, Karen, thanks for the, the invitation for everybody from Merrick. Uh, Pleasure to be here with all of you. Rodolfo Paraujo, I run our uh, FDI's corporate governance and activism practice. One of the verticals of this practice is really to help companies uh, build up or evolve their uh, ESG uh, programs. We have been working with companies across uh, market caps, private, publicly traded, and also across uh, across sectors, uh, helping them with the, for the most of state programs to really build up from, from scratch kind of situations. I joined FDI three years ago from uh, from institutional shareholder services, so I have been in, a, in the sustainability corporate governance space for a, for a while before that. Uh, again, uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for the invitation. Carrying uh, back to you. All right, thank you, Rodolfo. Um, all right. Well, um, I probably didn't mention this, but I am I will be the moderator moderator today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick off just kind of you know a little bit of a you know just kind of establish a lay of the land here. Um, as we kind of jump into our discussion. So, you know, um, you know, one of the reasons we're talking today, right, is kind of, you know, what is ESG measures, right? What are we measuring, right? What, what are we looking at across our organizations when we're really considering, um, you know, our ESG program, right? Um, and there's all different aspects to this. And, you know, as ESGs evolved and expanded, excuse me, um, <clears throat> As you can see, right, it's gotten broader, right? So when we all started early on, it was um, really a big focus on greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions, right? And that was, it seems so hard and so complex to tackle. And yet today, the environmental component seems a little bit easier for us to tackle, right? You hear about scope one and scope two from the greenhouse gas protocol, for example. Um, I think a lot of us have worked on that over the years, right? So as we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions, we're looking at, you know, waste production, we're looking at, um, you know, water management, we're looking at, you know, <clears throat> um, um, all kinds of, you know, materials and, and toxins that we're, we're maybe releasing from factories and those types of things. Those have been really complex issues that a lot of us have focused on over the years. And I think we've gotten a better handle on how to get some insight, how to track some data around it, how to have conversations around you know, how do we manage our environmental risk, right? How do we measure um, <clears throat> our risk and performance around the environmental components? Um, now, we're not perfect at it, right? But we've got a little bit of a foundational piece there because we've all been working on it for so many years. Now, we also were focused a lot, like for those of us that were doing corporate social responsibility, we did focus a lot on the social elements as well. Um, so social is not new to uh, the sustainability world or the corporate social responsibility world. Um, it is a big component of ESG now, right? And, um, you know, we think of ESG, we're thinking about investors and, you know, uh, people like that looking at information in a different way that we did, than we did maybe with CSR and sustainability reports. So, you know, it's broadened more, right? You know, we're looking at you know, DEI now is a big part of ESG, right? So looking at diversity and equity and inclusion and, um, you know, also bringing in, uh, you know, thinking about your, your employees, right? Uh, the human rights aspects of um, your suppliers, right? Uh, you know, every, everybody, everybody participates, right? Everybody's included in this. And it's all about, you know, how do we treat each other well with respect and dignity as we're kind of, you know, moving our, our businesses forward? Um, so with that, you know, we've got to understand our social metrics, right, and really understand how our people are being treated and what those dependencies are on um, our businesses in general. Um, and then from, from a governance perspective, right, the good news about governance is if you're from sustainability at CSR, it's probably a little like, yikes, you know, what is that? But, you know, at the end of the day, it's been going on forever. So, <clears throat> you know, we've always had governance going on within companies. So the good news is if you're starting out with your ESG program, you likely have others in your you know, finance team, accounting team, et cetera, that have been working a lot on governance, right? Maybe your compliance officer. Um, also with social, you know, you might be dealing, you know, your HR folks have probably been doing that for a long time. So a lot of this is how do we now bring this together? How do we bring this into a, uh, you know, one corporate view to really help a company oversee their ESG 
uh, risk and performance, right? So, you know, without being overwhelming around ESG, right, if you kind of break it up into these buckets and kind of recognize that, yeah, probably a lot of this stuff has been done across, you know, over the years within our organization. Now we just need to bring the building blocks together. Um, so with that, I'll go to the next slide. Let's see. <clears throat> so what are the ESG drivers today, right? You guys are probably seeing ESG in, in every, I don't know, every every article, any anything you're reading these days, right? We're reading about ESG. And so what are the drivers, right? Why all of a sudden has it bubbled up over the last couple of years? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, we've had the pandemic. We've had a lot of things that have kind of triggered these things. But we've also had, you know, other other drivers, right? Like investment, for example. So we're looking at, you know, $53 trillion in in you know, forecasted in ESG investment by 2025. Like that's phenomenal. Like we've never even heard of that before. Um, so obviously there's a, there were a lot of dollars going into it, um, which gives us a lot of teeth, you know, and, and it gives you a little bit more leverage internally to kind of build your business case around why it's important for a company to do this. Um, you know, you could potentially bring in more investment. You could bring in more uh, investors. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here for you to kind of leverage your uh, your ESG program, along with compliance, right? Like all of a sudden now, you know, the SEC is really moving forward on some of the regulatory requirements around uh, ESG disclosures, right? And that's kind of what we've all been waiting for for, for a long time. Um, and I think we're getting closer and closer. I never want to commit 100% because it's not, you know, our responsibility. It's going to be the SEC, but I think they've made really good progress. Um, and maybe Rodolfo and Kim can speak to that a little bit as well, any current information there. Um, and lastly is brand equity. And I, I hate to say that lastly, because brand equity, I think, was one of the drivers initially in the 70s or 80s, right? Remember, Nike had problems in their factories. And, you know, we've seen human rights issues across supply chains for a long time. And you, you can see the uh, immediate impact on a, on a company's uh, brand, uh, ultimately, ultimately their revenues, you know, et cetera. So, you know, by by building these ESG programs and really looking at your brand and being being uh, being really open minded about how do we best protect our brand, but also be really sensitive around these ESG concerns, right? So, you know, we've got a dual thing. We've got to drive profit, but we also have to, you know, care about people, the environment, et cetera. So, you know, protecting your brand is going to be a really key component to all of this. Um, next slide, please. Am I doing it? Okay. So you guys, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, we started this with human rights and scope three. Um, <clears throat> scope three has always been kind of a big mess <laughs> of what am I measuring? What am I tracking? What does it even mean to me? So this slide, you know, you, a lot of you probably have seen it. Um, you know, the greenhouse gas protocol has been talking about this for, for many, many years. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, right, a lot of us have already done a lot of scope one and two work, right? So um, with scope three, what we're really focusing now is is outside of your four walls, right? I've always kind of talked about scope one and two are kind of inside your own four walls, right? Running your operations, running your buildings, et cetera. And how do you track and measure all that information? Scope three is everything outside your four walls, essentially, right? Is, uh, you know, things that are, you're dependent on to run your business, but you're still responsible for, right? So it could be your supply chain. It could be your least assets, right? It could be your data centers. It could be your fleet, um, not your fleet, sorry, your freight, right? So there could be other aspects of the, the scope three that you're really trying to get your arms around. So we want to talk a little bit about that today um, and how you can better position your company, right, to manage and start looking at, you know, how, first of all, what is scope three to me? You know, what does that mean to my organization? Um, what are the dependencies there? And then how do I, you know, how do I tackle it from a corporate perspective, right? How do we make progress versus like, I understand there's a problem, but how do I make progress? How do I identify what's going on? And then how do I make progress? Um, so with that, I'd like to, you know, jump into that part of the conversation today um, by starting with um, our next slide, which will be Kim, right? So Kim, let's talk a little bit about, <clears throat> yeah, Supply chain responsibility, right? What does it even mean when you're looking at the supply chain, right? Like I always like to say the su supply chain isn't faceless, right? What are we dealing with here? How, what have you seen over the years? And, you know, what does the S mean to you in ESG? Absolutely. So when we think about 
just our our impact in a company it's it's the four walls you control so this is very similar to what you're saying with the scope three so when you talk about supply chain responsibility all of a sudden it's the working conditions of so many more people and all these people who contribute to your products the final product so one of the big initiatives we have is our supply chain responsibility and social social compliance audits social audits different names and we work with our first tier suppliers and we go and audit them to ensure that they have a minimum standard of how they treat their employees and their work their workplaces um, to in, in agreement to what we have and this is really challenging at this moment to be really candid it's much it, this is a challenging time given supply chain shortages um, labor shortages covid so i've never been in a situation where we've had to reschedule audits so much because factories are uh, shutting down for a little while there and then they're having to ramp back up and it, it's been interesting in that way um, but it's really critical because it's these types of moments where we really want to make sure they still have good working conditions they're being treated well they're being paid paid on time the correct amount they're not working um, too many hours in excess of the local law uh, etc so uh, that's why that piece is really critical the other piece now is this used to be something that companies did just because it was the right thing to do and they're managing their risks uh, we're, at, we're actually coming up on the Forced Labor Prevention Act, which will get final details uh, this June, uh, June 21st, from CBP, or Customs and Border Protection. And what that does is Customs and Border Protection will, hopefully we'll get more details soon, they will withhold containers coming into the country if there's a suspicion of forced labor. Uh, particularly from China with the Uyghur, force, uh, Uyghur population and ensuring that you don't have any slave labor that made your products coming into the U.S. And so all of a sudden, while this was, this is the right thing to do, now the government is forcing us to ensure that we're doing this and we're doing the right thing. And what this means, we'll have more details in a couple weeks, but um, definitely map out your supply chain, look at that, look at um, whether you've communicated your expectations to your suppliers, whether they're doing it, what your due diligence programs are, and then if they need assistance for their sub-tiers, your sub-tiers, um, you might want to help them out as well, or at least get them the right information that they can send out to everybody. Um, that's, that's basically where I've spent most of my career is in supply chain responsibility audits, looking at uh, how, how working conditions. Um, the next piece that you guys might know about is conflict minerals, and this is also part of the, the S, right? Looking at where your minerals are sourced from and what their working conditions are. And this has been in, I think it's been in law now for since 2013. Um, and you can, some companies, they still send out templates manually to their suppliers to eventually trace back to where these minerals are being procured essentially. And then um, some companies use software like, like Navex to get this data and then to compile all the data and then aggregate it and then send their require, um, the report, the required report back to the SEC. So this is another initiative where it's driven from a social aspect, but now looked at by the government, um, I guess I shouldn't say now. And then the last piece is diversity. So we also have supplier diversity uh, in my program at Applied, and we look at how do we increase diversity within our spend. And oftentimes people might see it as, oh, we don't want to work with that supplier just because they're diverse and um, this isn't a charity case but really you need to look at is oftentimes with supply chain relationships with the customer it could be i've worked with this person in my past uh, past job um, but the supplier or i went to college with this person and so even though we don't think about that being exclusive we aren't being inclusive of people maybe we haven't worked with before and so what, this is why it's really important to think about having a diversity program, looking at women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, veterans, et cetera, and including people and giving them a fair opportunity to do business with your company. Fantastic. <clears throat> Kim, just real quick, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of curious if companies are thinking about, like diversity in the supply chain is an interesting component, right? And Sometimes you're kind of locked into a supplier because maybe you know that's the only service provider that offers whatever widget or service, et cetera. How do you kind of how do you kind of deal with that, right? As a company, do you? Uh, well, I guess you never want a single point of failure, right? So you know how do you how do you you know I guess how do you 
what would you recommend to a company, right, in terms of looking at diversity in the supply chain? Like, is it ownership of the business? Like, what, what aspect of diversity are you talking about in terms of the supply chain? That's a really great question. So we at look at it, we, we count diverse spend with certified. So you can get certified through different organizations. So we bank, for example, for women owned businesses or NMSDC for minority owned businesses. And while we have companies that don't have the certifications, we'll encourage them to get their certifications because you do have different uh, access to different um, RFPs. You might have different tools that will help certain companies find diverse suppliers. So we really encourage them to, to do that. Um, it's, it would be considered owned, controlled, and operated. And so the whole point of the certification is they verify that they're indeed owned and operated and controlled by, by these parties. And as far as um, sourcing, that's always challenging, especially at a company like ours, we're very technical, right? We make machines to make semiconductor chips. This isn't necessarily like a plain white t-shirt or a notebook where it might be a little bit easier to swap out without having um, heavier uh, consequences. So it's really important to get with the engineering team to, to work and really understand what the, the specs are and um, be really really respectful of what the requests are and also willing to learn and um, mm -hmm. making sure you get a seat at the table when they're deciding who they work with. And so that's a really big piece of diversity is, okay, we want to make sure that everyone wins. It's not just about, okay, we need to meet diverse spend, but let's make sure that they're a great partner. The quality is just as good as or better. The cost comes at, in as the same as other companies and uh, the customer service is great as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. With that, let's go to the next slide and see what Rodolfo has. All right, Rodolfo. Let me jump into this, uh, this slide. Maybe that's one of the one of the big questions that we have been getting from uh, from clients. And uh, the questions basically start this way. So we have all the regulators and shareholders asking now us to do more on uh, on climate. So what exactly are they asking us? It's just to produce more information and disclose more information to them. And as Karen was saying about the scope of and three, to put that information out there to the market, or are they asking us to do more? And our take on this, and coming from both sides, both investors and regulators, that they're asking for action at this time. One of the points that you see here is the evolution of shareholder proposals. Most shareholder proposals, they were focusing on uh, on reports, so that you have the report and be transparent in terms of climate change, what's your footprint, especially being able to publish also scope three emissions. And there was a transition in uh, 2020, from 2021 to 2022, that you begin to see more climate action being required. It's interesting because you, you see a huge spike in 2021 in terms of uh, support levels. It went up to 60% for the for the proposal they are demanding action. This year, it reduced a little bit to, to about 40% 40, 40 level, but it's still at the same trend. We have seen a transition that uh, unless a proposal becomes too prescriptive, uh, shareholders are willing to support the additional uh, like proposals that would push companies to do more, to act. If you go to the SEC and the proposal regulation on climate change, you're going to see a very similar pattern because it's, uh, it's more than just uh, than just talking about uh, the publication of uh, your inventory of your emissions, scopes one, two, and three. They are talking about what's the strategy, how you manage risk. So it is really beginning to drive actions more than just disclosures. So if we go to the next slide. That's kind of the, the highlights that we have been uh, talking to, to clients on, uh, on, uh, on what they have to be aware at this point, both based on the, the demands from, uh, from regulators, but also the demands from, uh, from shareholders and how they have to think about their whole position on climate change. Uh, first question is, do you have a climate change strategy more than just pushing out numbers or at least calculating your uh, your emissions. Do you have a way to mitigate those and to drive to net zero over a certain period of, of time? Of course, limiting that to, to 2050. And doing that aligned with, uh, in a science-based fashion that you can even uh, be certified with SBTI that you basically have a plan that is effective in terms of mitigating emissions. 
The second that we have seen in many discussions with, uh, with shareholders is what's the governance around uh, climate issues. Uh, you need to be managed those issues. Are there people working to basically develop the policies, the strategies, the objectives, and push them forward inside companies so that you're going to be able to meet those objectives? The third one is the risk management process. There is not only transition, but also physical risk. The transition risk is more related to maybe changing regulations, changing markets that would affect the value of the, the assets. But there is also physical risks, like you operate a business, there are sea levels go up, where there is more uh, extreme weather events, you might get affected and you need to be managed those, uh, those risks. Uh, the fourth one would be, have you set emission reduction targets? And that's where the action comes. It has to be short and medium-term targets, but also the long-term ones, so that you can meet that deadline and become that zero before a certain period of time. And lastly, in crucial, that we have been discussing this with many clients, is your GHG data, emissions data, so your emissions are ready for assurance or uh, audit. We're getting in a position now that your numbers are being put out in, in, uh, in they're going to be out in regulatory filing, filings. Uh, there is going to be significant scrutiny and there is also risk of litigation. Working with the raw data and the base that you have in terms of climate issues, building that data with high quality so that you can manage your targets is essential, especially so that you can avoid, avoid in the future being accused of misleading investments in terms of uh, your position and how you're basically evolving your, uh, your emissions uh, profile. But that's kind of the, the key uh, recommendations that are given to clients, key questions that we have helping them to, to answer and evolve in terms of their uh, climate change uh, strategy. Great. <clears throat> Hey, Rodolfo, before we move into uh, our next section, I just have a quick question on that. Um, so today we're talking about scope three, right? And I think a lot of people are challenged by what does emissions mean in terms of scope three, right? And how am I going to tackle that? And how do I deal with data legitimacy? And you know, how, wh where do I start on the scope three aspect of this? Do you have any insight into you know maybe you know how to get started? Baby steps um, would be fabulous if you have any ideas there. Sure. So the first point: use the GHD protocol they give you really good guidance in terms of how to build the whole uh, inventory that you, you have on uh, on GHG emissions. But the, if I think about the, the steps, there, there are two different approaches to calculations of uh, scope 3 emissions. The first one is a direct approach that, for example, think about the scope 3 is going to be uh, the emissions that are outside your core operations. So they're going to be in your uh, upstream, maybe in your supply chain, downstream when you are distributing your products or your clients are using the, the products that you, that you produce. Within that whole uh, two pieces, uh, you might be able to go directly to those companies and ask, for example, I'm buying you certain type of materials, what the footprint of those materials that I'm buying. You can get that information directly and just plug into the, the model. The other way that we have been helping clients is also to uh, use uh, econometric models to estimate what the emissions based in each one of these segments. That's a shortcut in that it's very close to the, most of the time, to the real uh, number. Many companies use that to, to publish their the reports based on those estimations. But we also have clients that have really dove into the, the, the work with their, their suppliers. And in the end, uh, one in the food business, for example, in the end they found out that their footprint, because they were operating already with better, a better profile, their supplier had better profile in terms of sustainability, they found out that their actual uh, emissions were substantially lower than the one that were estimated in the, in the past, as they got the, the real data from, uh, from the suppliers. Hmm. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of catch one of the questions that I saw in the uh, audience uh, chat. Um, okay, so uh, Jess, we can go to the next one. Um, <clears throat> and so now what we're going to do is uh, before we go into a, a further, you know, Q&A section, uh, we're just going to pause briefly for a poll question. Um, and it's really simple, right? Would you like to speak to, uh, speak with someone about, oh, sorry. Would you like to speak with an ESG expert on improving your reporting? Um, please go ahead and, you know, select yes or no. Um, and uh, it would, I'll just give you guys a few minutes to go ahead and answer that. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and move into more uh, Q&A and make this more conversational um, than PowerPoint, okay? Okay. 
All right. That's probably a good amount of time, right? That's only a yes or no question. So we'll go ahead and, and move on. Um, Jess, if you could go ahead and uh, advance our slides. Um, great. Okay. So is your company ready? All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump into Q&A, right? So something's timing out here for me, hopefully not for everybody else. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump into uh, some of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, and then I'll go ahead and divvy it up between the two of you and the three of us who just kind of talk through it, okay? Um, so one question came in, um, this assignment of responsibility for scope three carbon emissions is unclear and appears to be an issue the GHG protocol is currently reviewing. Any thoughts from the speakers? Um, and this might be related to the SEC requirement too, right? They're, they're only going, I think with scope three, right? They're gonna go after certain companies at a certain size. Uh, smaller companies won't have to address scope three. Um, but uh, either one of you, uh, Rodolfo, Kim, have you been working with the uh, greenhouse gas protocol at all with some of the SCO3 uh, parameters and some of the challenges that they may be having or just trying to succinctly offer this or some kind of solution to the market to simplify this area? Rodolfo, you want to start? I, I can jump in. Uh, so not specifically work with, with them in terms of the evolution, but that's not something that we haven't seen in the past, like right? evolving the, the concept. So there is a, a lot of uh, commentary in terms of the double counting that you're going to face whenever you're working with scope three. Some of the parameters, depending on the, on the type of industry, are not perfect to like a, a perfect fit, and that we understand that. So we're trying to evolve the, the process as they, they go. But the, the main point is this: uh, think about this as maybe the best tool that we that we have, the best guidance is the guidance also that the SEC is using for the, the whole collation. That's what we use with CCFT also as SBTI recommend. So uh, working with them in the evolution and they make sure that you you are able to follow the guidelines and adjust guidelines for specific sectors as needed uh, should not be a significant issue. We find out that it's really useful and uh, has been a, a great fit for, for our clients. Great, thank you for that. Okay, um, another question that came in. Um, Kim, I'm going to direct this one to you. Um, how do you how do you engage suppliers to address and mitigate ESG risk, right? I mean, that's that's the big challenge. You talked a little bit about audits and such. So, yeah, what's the best approach these days, knowing that there are some additional challenges that we're all dealing with? Um, yeah, what are what are some of your recommendations to just kind of figure it out, right? And how to just kind of get started understanding what those risks are and, and how do we mitigate those risks? So I definitely think that um, coming in as a partner versus coming in with a a customer with a stick makes a huge difference. And so I've been on the supplier side. I know what that's like. Uh, your your company's trying to get stuff out the door and products out the door and then also trying to meet all these other requirements. So one of the things that we do is we really emphasize on partnership. So for example, last year we had, uh, we gave 43 different webinars, different uh, 43 different unique topics, webinars for our suppliers covering different things from, from ESG, from reporting, GHG, uh, ethics, everything, right? Just everything under the sun that you'd think is typically under ESG, how to prep for an audit, et cetera. And I think that's important because that builds trust. And so letting them know we're here because these are requirements that you're going to see at some point, whether it's from a different customer, whether it's from the government, we want to be here to help you build these programs so that you can get there and also in a way that is in a time frame, in a timeline that you're more comfortable with. So that that's first, first of all. Um, secondly, really think creatively of how different you can have different resources for them. And so if you have some resources that you can share with them that you get and you pass along the way, I think that also helps with the trust. Um, the other is uh, talking to your your commodity managers of, okay, this is why we need to do it and explain it to them in a way where it makes sense to them too. So they don't see it as this is just another requirement or they don't resent your program, right? Because they're going to be your ally when they're communicating with the supplier. Um, it, it's really important that you have a universal front when you talk to the, your suppliers. So you, you can't yourself say, this is really important, but then the commodity manager says, no, it's not important. Um, just go ahead and make your stuff. Go ahead and have 120 hours of overtime a week. So making sure everybody else is um, on the same page. And so one of the things that we do is we communicate with our commodity managers 
on their staff meetings at least once a month throughout the company to ensure that they know what's going on, they don't feel blindsided, and then also giving them additional resources. So if the supplier goes to them with a question first, because they're usually the first point of contact, that they feel comfortable in answering the, those for them. That's a really I good point, know. right? Yeah, yeah. Make sure we engage others within the organization, right? Rodolfo, you have something to add there? Yeah, I was going to, to mention that that's what uh, Kim just mentioned is one of the key things that we have been discussing also with uh, with clients. Uh, the one side of this is really to build this more collaborative kind of environment with your, your suppliers. And uh, and also internally, one of the key points that Kim mentioned is like make sure that you that internally the, the, your corporation, uh, your company is aligned uh, throughout the different sectors because it's very common to see the sustainability team trying to get the most uh, in terms of the supply, make sure that labor conditions are great and, and they, they have a great, uh, like, great thing to report from the work being done by their suppliers. And then you have in procurement and maybe in the, in the production, you have like those last minute requests and you need to do a ton of overtime. And sometimes these uh, suppliers uh, are not able to fulfill some of these orders if they don't do significant amount of overtime more than it would be in theory allowed for them to, to do that the company would like them to, uh, to do. So having this internal alignment is, uh, is key. And the other point that, that I would say is that besides being, having this collaboration with uh, internal alignment and collaboration with, uh, with your suppliers, it's also to make sure that you use technology and you also make sure that you use uh, the other resource that you have to, to track and find out if you have issues before they pop up to the, to the public. Uh, so, and, and that's the, the situation about make sure that you build the relationship, deal with that, but make sure also that you have, we have clients working with us on, on blockchain to make sure that they can track supply chain without having to have such a, a close uh, relationship, even with audits to certain tiers of suppliers, because it's easy to have with uh, 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 tier one suppliers, you go to tier three, things become a lot more, uh, more difficult to, to happen. And at that level, we also run investigations from clients so that they can have a clear picture of their uh, supply chain. And again, it's anticipating problems. Many times we're not talking about just replacing suppliers, we're talking about, talking about identifying problems and then putting together mitigation plans with the suppliers so that they can go back and comply with whatever the, the company needs them to comply with. I think that's a really important point, right? You know, we always want to make sure that our suppliers may, you know, they're our partners, right? They're, we, we need them, they need us. Um, and so, you know, the more we can collaborate and help everybody kind of be successful in this area, right? Um, some of this stuff is really foreign to your suppliers, right? Like what is ESG? What am I doing? Why am I doing this? I have to make, you know, I have to, I have to deal with making the widget that you need for your business. I don't have time for this, right? So there's a lot of challenges so the more we can kind of, you know, help the supplier, partner with them, provide them with some guidance on how to make some of these improvements, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, or better results from the supply chain, right? Um, and that kind of goes into another question that somebody is asking is, you know, how do we expect, uh, you know, how do we expect the supply chain sustainability to grow over the next five years, right? So um, I know over the last, you know, you know, if we kind of go back in time, you know, um, We've made a lot of progress, I think, in the supply on the supply chain side in terms of responsible supply chain, ethical sourcing. Um, however, we have a lot more work to do. So I think over the next five years, you know, the good news is there is more visibility now into what we're calling scope three, right? And most of that will be around supply chain. So, you know, that that's one thing that we didn't have in the past, right? We had to kind of push it forward. Um, it wasn't as easy to kind of create that visibility. Um, you know, we all understood the supply chain, but we weren't really always thinking about the uh, ESG side of things, right? So um, I would just say over the next five years, in my humble opinion, I think it's just, it's going to be more structured. Um, hopefully companies and supply chains will start aligning under ESG rules that are kind of consistent across various industries. Um, so there's some consistency and there isn't this kind of hodgepodge, you know, of different standards and, and disclosures and uh, metrics that all these different companies and suppliers have to adhere to. Um, so for me personally, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, hopefully five years from now, we do have more standards available. Um, we're moving in that direction. We've got some established now, um, you know, but, but that's kind of my viewpoint. Uh, Kim, what are you thinking over the next five years or so in terms of, you know, the supply chain sustainability growth? 
I'm not sure about growth, but I definitely agree with you on the structure. And so what I try to tell people is back when United started um, 10 years ago, plus this was sort of the government regulation, right? And then corporate responsibility was sort of up here. And mm -hmm. over time, the, the going above and beyond was moves up a little bit, but the expectation, right, has been going up a lot more. So eventually it becomes more of a compliance piece, whether it's complying with government law regulations or whether it's just your customer expectations and complying to their their requests. So um, I, I, it definitely changes the, the game because now you, you have to do it in a lot of respects. And so I think that means more bu bigger budgets, hopefully more headcount. So in a lot of ways, really positive growth for the field. Yeah, good, yeah. Um, yeah, Rodolfo, what are you thinking? Uh, what are you seeing um, in, in your world in terms of over the next five years? What do you what do you anticipate? We are talking a lot about uh, the increase in transparency and how much this can generate both risks and opportunities for, for companies. Uh, and transparency comes from sometimes technology, like I was mentioning, with blockchain, you begin to have real visibility over issues that goes from labor, human rights, uh, also uh, emissions from the entire supply chain going way beyond what you're able sometimes to measure now, because look, you have your tier one suppliers. Your tier two is already a little bit distant because you can still sometimes audit them and get better information from them. Then you go to tier three, tier three uh, sometimes uh, your tier two business to your tier three is, is a tiny percentage. So the, the flow of information and the visibility becomes way more limited uh, when you go to that, that distance in terms of the, of the tiers. As you add technology, of course you gain better visibility. You're going to see not only from your first layer, but also all the layers in your supply chain, and you're going to be able to really identify the companies that are working with a sustainable supply chain versus a, a supply chain that is not as sustainable as it appeared to, to be then it means that you have to work with your suppliers or maybe uh, select different suppliers. And that impacts costs. And that's one of the things that becomes really challenging. Like you're going to improve sustainability of your supply chain, many times this means increasing costs. And how can you mitigate that? So you're going to optimize your supply chain, or maybe because you're offering a more sustainable product, product you can have some pricing power that can mitigate any kind of margin compression as a result of that increasing price. So additional visibility is going to bring more challenge on supply chain management, and that's going to drive additional efforts on companies to try to, to mitigate some of the risks, but also take advantage of the opportunity because you can really position your company as a sustainable company because of the supply chain that you work with. Good, yeah, some more transparency. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> So another another question that came in, and this is a hard one, right? Like we've we've all grappled with this for many years, right? Is how do you gain? How, yeah, how do you gain supplier buy-in on ESG sustainability initiatives, right? When it when it's obviously you know it may not be a big priority for them, right? It may become a big priority for them, but um, I I think you know in the past I've seen. Um, it depends on the company, right? And, and their relationship with their suppliers. Some people are iron fists, right? And they're forcing them to do it because they have to adhere to the, the corporate, you know, uh, compliance program or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, I've seen other companies that are really loose about it. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not as hard on their suppliers, right? So it kind of goes both ways. It's, it, it really does, in my opinion, you know, I've seen a lot of companies that just behaviorally, it's how you, what kind of relationship you have with your suppliers. Um, but, you know, like Kim, you know, what, what do you do, right? Um, if you don't use an iron fist, right, is there, a, is there an easier, uh, more collaborative way to engage your suppliers? So um, they understand it's a priority, even though it's not for them internally, but it is in terms of, you know, their relationship with you and potentially other companies. You know, how do we, how do we communicate that most effectively? A lot of this, of all, some of our suppliers see me as a resource because they, they see that I've had a lot of experience. So there are certain suppliers that I actually have a standing call with um, every two weeks um, on, on Wednesday nights. And then we also have a Q&A session every Tuesday and Wednesday night that they can just drop in and have anonymous questions. So I think that helps build a lot of that buy-in. Um, I think thematically, though, what's really important is treating them like a partner. So, for example... Mm -hmm. I think there's sometimes people will say, oh, they don't want to do this audit right now. And they're just using COVID as an excuse. I think you have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, what's actually the COVID situation happening right now uh, over there? Um, let, let's give them some flexibility. And I think 
by being very understanding and cooperative, we actually get a lot more engagement than going through uh, using the iron fist. I'm sure that works for other people, but I don't think people mm -hmm. would find me scary anyway if I tried that method. So um, <laughs> I, I go with the honey, the honey method versus anything else. There you go. All right. Well, that's okay, right? Everybody has their own style, and like I said, it's it's up to your relationship, right, with your suppliers. You know your supply chain. I think that's brilliant. It's unfortunate for you that you're up at night, but that's brilliant that you have those collaborative sessions, right? And they have an opportunity to engage and and learn, right, and and figure out how they can how they can do better, right, in 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 regards to all of this. So I think that's a fabulous approach to take. Um, so uh, Rodolfo. So a lot of yeah. companies, right, and I'm seeing a question right now about this is, you know, it's, yeah, this is all great, but how do, what do I do? Like, how do I get these social and governance metrics in front of my supply chain? Like, how do I really understand how they're performing there? Is it that they're answering surveys and I'm getting that information? Like, how how is a company realistically going to understand and get that information from their suppliers as best they can? For uh, most most uh, experience that I have is basically self-assessment. Uh, you sort of have the survey, you can yeah. gather some of the information they're doing, and on top of that, you have uh, you have audits to make sure that those uh, that, that those whatever information you're getting, they are real, they are reliable. Uh, another way, going back to the, the previous discussion that you were asking about how to engage the, the supply chain, that's part of the answer oh, yeah. also to yep. that in terms of being uh, reliable, having reliable information uh, on the social, on the, on the governance side also. Uh, is the fact that uh, you can work, depending on your size, uh, look, there are some companies that they represent sometimes a huge portion of the business of a supplier. If they effectively communicate why they want the supplier to achieve some or hit some goals, achieve some objections, they're going to get what they, they need and, and the information also that they need. They're going to have other, uh, so, uh, other companies that they represent a smaller piece of the business of those, uh, of those suppliers. So going and sometimes working with an association or, or building partnership with other companies, your sectors, competitors, you can drive the communication of the, the items clearly to the, those suppliers saying, look, as an industry, that's what we need. We see many times success cases with this type of initiative. And uh, as an industry, that's what we need. And as a result, the supplier becomes way more incentivized to meet those requirements because now you as a group represent a big percentage of the of the, the company. So this is valid for the goals that you have. This is valid also for the information that you need to get from them, for example, the social side, the information about labor and human rights, how they, they, what policies they, they have, sometimes anti-corruption policies also, but how they are working in a way that is compliant with your uh, guidelines. Yeah, thank you for adding that. Um, yeah, we have another question that came in that kind of, you know, I think everybody gets hung up on scope three, right? And I, I wish there was a better way to define it, right? Because it's so broad. Um, so we have a couple of questions about scope three, right? Like, what does it really mean? You know, like, specifically for me within a company, I have to tackle scope three, right? You know, what are, what are the challenges associated with understanding my own scope what's material to my business, and then how do I build kind of an ESG strategy around it, right? So it's not easy, as we all know, right? This is not a, a, an easy thing to take on. Um, but I think what we're all recommending is, you know, baby steps, first of all, right? Understand what's material to your business, understand, you know, your suppliers, understand internally what's going on, um, and, and then figuring out what aspects of scope three you can manage and tackle initially. Um, and then kind of phase out, you know, how you're going to approach the entire scope three aspect of, um, you know, measuring it for your own company. Um, you know, with that, you guys, I mean, I, I scope three is, a, is, is just a huge challenge. Um, you know, there's some parts of scope three, like business travel, right? Like that's become really easy because we're not traveling as much, right? But scope three, you know, business travel was a big deal, right? For sustainability reporting, for example, and that was scope three, right? Because that's outside your business, but you're dependent on it. Um, and then, you know, you've got your supply chain side. So I guess, you know, um, Rodolfo, I'll start with you, right? In terms of like, if you're thinking about ESG, um, ESG scope three, right? And, um, you know, you're thinking about how do I develop a program to kind of kick it off and get started? 
what would you recommend in terms of just, you know, yeah, let's, let's take a view, let's look at, you know, a snapshot of your company and then delve into one, two, and three as kind of a phased approach. Um, is that kind of something that you would recommend or, you know, how do you, how do you, how would you recommend someone kind of tackle that component? And first of all, could you please, you know, from your perspective, what do you think scope three means? Perfect. So, uh, I can use even ourselves, so FTI Consulting, we are a public company. Uh, we have all this effort also put out in the, in the market as an example of the work that we're doing here for ourselves. So uh, if you think about scopes one, two, and three, one is what you generate, the emissions that you generate basically within the business, within your operation. You go to scope two, it's basically the energy, the electricity that you buy from third parties and the emissions related to that electricity that you use in your internal operations. That's what scope two is. Go to scope three is basically everything else in the value chain. So you have to you have raw materials that then have to be extracted or produced. Think about the farm producing cotton that then is going to be used to produce a shirt. You have all the, the evolution of that product up to a point that you receive the products, let's say a retailer, that shirt is completely produced and transported until the point that comes to the, to the retailer. When the retailer gets the delivery of that uh, shirt to basically sell, then it becomes their own scope one or, or two emissions. But before that, it's basically the emissions that are generated throughout the entire supply chain. Let's say that you just produce shirts, but you have a distribution uh, network, and then you're going to move that away uh, to the distribution, and maybe that product that you're producing is going to be used by third parties and generate some additional emissions. That would be the, the, the downstream. And also, it's not related directly to your operation, but these are also emissions that exist because of the type of product that you produce, the type of service that you, that you provide. For FTI, we are a consulting company. Uh, so professional service, most of our internal emissions are going to be related to the buildings that we occupy, the electricity, the, the heat and cooling that we use for scopes one and, and two. And then you go to scopes three, you're going to have employee commuting, you're going to have travel, uh, and that's going to be like the big items that are going to generate the most of the, of the scope three for us. Uh, in terms of the building blocks, we really the, the step one is really calculate what you have. Have a clear picture of where your emissions are located. Um, for most companies, uh, the majority of emissions are going to be in scope uh, three. You map the whole picture, scopes one and two are easier to, to calculate. Make sure that you have that picture. Then you move into scope three and you do the estimates that you need or get the information from your from different pieces of your part of your supply chain or your value chain. And from there, when you have the picture of the three uh, scopes, uh, then you can begin to think about what next steps are, which is basically to begin to develop goals in terms of reduction of your carbon footprint and begin to have a plan to become net zero at a certain point in time. So, for example, for FTI, we developed a plan to basically hit that by 2030. And for every company, it's going to be slightly different. You have to think about what's the deduction. You have to go probably it's real reduction in terms of taking away 90% of your uh, emissions, and then you have some residual emissions that are hard to, to mitigate that you're going to use some type of offsets to basically compensate for those specific emissions. But that's generally the step-by-step -step in terms of calculating and then mitigating uh, emissions. Excellent, good, thank you for that. I'm sure that will be helpful for everybody to hear. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of along the same lines, I think. Um, Kim, you know, maybe you can touch on this a little bit. This just came in. Um, what, if any, collaboration with other customers have you seen or would you recommend to facilitate changes in supplier behavior, such as performing GHD inventory or other activities that may be a heavy lift for the supplier? And I think that's what we're all worried about, right, is, you know, the more pressure on the supplier, um, you know, they're, they're going to start throwing bad data at us, right. Just to kind of get, get, you know, check the box, so to speak, or whatever it might be. So again, I, I think it goes back to, I, I love the way you're collaborating with your suppliers, right? So that's one aspect of it. Um, yeah, there are other, any other ways of, uh, just kind of helping them facilitate changes where, you know, they're, they'll start engaging on a more regular basis. Is it more, is it just the collaboration aspect, communication? You know, what, what are your recommendations there? Yeah, for sure. Um, 
I think this this is a question that comes up a lot too, is how do you leverage industry associations? So for us, we're a member of the Responsible Business Alliance, which is the largest industry association in supply chain sustainability. So that helps. And a lot our, our competitors, a lot of them are members. And then um, a lot of our customers are members and a lot of our suppliers are members as well. And that helps in the sense where a when we have this similar tools and requests all and they see that different customers are theirs have similar requests going through the same system, same code of conduct, et cetera, that helps a lot, right? Because then they're not having to do 1800 different, uh, just all these different surveys um, of different kinds that are unique to the customer. So that's one of the things I really try to drive at Applied is what's everyone else in the industry doing? Can we leverage what resources we have as, that we've created as an industry so that our suppliers don't have audit fatigue survey fatigue, et cetera. And then that way, um, that also helps us when we go to them and and say, hey, if you do this for us, you can also reuse it for another customer. And usually they're a lot more open knowing that they won't have to do so many separate activities. Yeah, that's good, right. Yeah, kind of align them with others, right, within the industry. I think that's a great point, right? Have people start coordinating or working with some of the uh, consortiums out there or nonprofits that are really helping drive standards and collaboration, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're running into, let's see, we got about four minutes left. Rodolfo, you have anything to add on that as we kind of wrap up here around um, just, you know, getting your suppliers engaged, you know, helping them change behavior uh, to start participating um, in your ESG programs? I think that the, the point that uh, Kim just mentioned about working with mm -hmm. the association, some of the, the alliances or these associations is going to, to drive much of this, uh, this result. We're also seeing that because everybody in the market looks emissions, everybody in the market is asking information about emissions. It became also a differential for some of the suppliers to be able to provide that information at a more uh, granular level. Uh, then mm -hmm. becoming kind of standard. And we've seen some of them begin to work with assurance. So it, it's just saying it's a natural evolution as that makes business sense for most of them. So we are going to see some level of information because it's across the board. All companies want, all companies need that is going to be easier to, to get. And others that work as a group, work in an association, and uh, asking some of these uh, suppliers sometimes to become part of some of these associations and comply to some of these uh, issues is going to facilitate also not only getting information of what they are doing, but also make sure that they are complying with certain uh, norms that you want them to comply with. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw out one more question. Let's just, you know, we have about three minutes. Let's go ahead and, and kind of wrap this up with... Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I kind of like this question, and maybe one of you guys can uh, can help with this. Is um, you know, what's okay? So this, is, I think, it's an interesting question, right? What are the different categories of scope three, which are, we already talked about, right? Everything outside your four walls, et cetera. But what is the difference between upstream and downstream scope three, right? Just generally speaking, you guys, to the audience, just so they have a general understanding. Um, really quickly, Kim, what, what's your upstream downstream scope three? And what do you think the differences are? Um, so yeah, you have one that, uh, so let's say an example, Netflix, right? They have a, one of their scope three, I'm sure is a offsite data service that they get through their Amazon web service or whoever that's their hosting. That's a lot of their GHG um, one way. For, for Applied, for example, we have, uh, we make big machines. So our big machines get plugged in at the customer site so that's actually something that happens after it leaves the factory. So I usually, what I do is I think about it before the product or after the product, um, the production of the product. And for, for us, the, the plugging of the machines is actually a, probably a much larger part of the scope three than it would be for most other companies. Great, Rodolfo, you have anything to share on the upstream downstream? Definition. Same view here. It's uh, basically the same structure. It's like what comes after whatever your product is and what happens after you create the, the product from distributing it to the use uh, of, the, of the product. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and end our session. Um, I hope this was uh, helpful and useful to our audience. Um, this is a big, big area that we're all trying to tackle. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it's about people, it's about human rights, and it's about making sure that we can still be productive as businesses uh, while still protecting the, uh, you know, our, the dignity and, um, you know, um, and, and advancement of the people that are working across our supply chain, right? So I'm really glad that we're focusing on this and uh, we've got a lot of good insight here. Um, Kim and Rodolfo, thank you so much for your expertise today. Um, if anybody has any questions, of course, feel free to follow up. Um, come to navex.com. We're happy to provide you with information. Um, and uh, with that, I'll go ahead and sign off. And everyone, please have a great rest of the day and stay safe and healthy out there. Thank you. Thank you.